Uh, so I am, uh, uh, sorry, I'll introduce Forrest, I'll follow the slides. Uh, Forrest Gray, right here, and I'm Derek Eater, and we're, uh, we're both with uh, Open City, uh, also, uh, Paul. Uh, so let's just get into it. Um, so how many people here have ever worked with data that they did not create themselves? Okay, great. How many times were you able to use the data without cleaning or processing it at all? Okay, last hand. Say that again, sorry. Okay, <laughs> right. So what kind of problems do you guys come across? Uh, please, anybody who's got uh, uh, Say that again? Encoding of the data, okay. Missing values, okay. Say that? Internal inconsistencies. The hand over there? I can't load a social network into RAM. Yeah? First world problems, okay. Anybody else? Say that? Column shifts, yeah, I hate that one too. All right. Right, okay. So those are, those are many, many issues. I was hoping someone would say multiple records that represent the same thing, but it doesn't, if they show up separately. All right, well, so some of those things you described, we can help with, especially the one I just mentioned. <laughs> All right, so we talked about some solutions you guys came up with. Actually, well, what, what do you guys usually do? Do you like write a script? Google Refine, I'm glad you said that. Has anybody here ever used Google Refine before? Raise your hand. Okay, if you don't know what that is and you've worked with data before, um, it'll be like a light shining down from heaven. It is a great tool. It's, uh, it's uh, I think, I forget who you originally uh, built it, but Google bought this company. I think it was Freebase? Does that sound right? Okay. And essentially, it's uh, a, it, it opens up a web server, it launches a web server on your machine and gives you like a nice little interface where you can load it data. It accepts like JSON, XML, and CSV, KML, pretty much anything under the sun. And then you can run a bunch of uh, clustering algorithms to combine fields. You can do uh, cell phone. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. So, yeah, you can go to go Google that. Uh, yeah. All right. So um, it understands Python. You can script it, right, which is great. You can uh, run a bunch of tasks, and it can remember what you just did, and you can apply it again to other, other, uh, other data sets. So that's kind of great, right? Although it doesn't kind of do, it doesn't do it all for you automatically, right? You still have to manually kind of step through some of these steps, even if it's just for the first time. Even if you have a new data set that you're applying to, if the fields have changed, you kind of have to apply it, you have to munge that data. So every time you get a new data set, you kind of have to redo a bunch of steps that are not necessarily like uh, uh, intellectually uh, challenging, but they're certainly uh, challenging in terms of the amount of time it takes. Um, which leads me into this last one, right? How much time did that take you to do, right? Compared to, say, the entire scope of you working with that data, like what percentage of time do you think it took you just cleaning the data as a whole? Anybody have a, not, like a number in their mind? Like 20%, 30%, 50%? I think it's higher. It's like around 50%, maybe even more for me, just to get the data in order. Okay. And like I said before, were you able to reuse that like as a whole for the next thing. Sometimes yes, like with Refine, sometimes yes, it does help, but not always, right? So most of the time spent working with real world data is not spent on the analysis, but spent in preparing the data. We want to fix that. You want to step in uh, through this next slide here for us? Sure, so like, so some of the problems- Use the mic. Guys, oh yeah. Some of the problems that we guys talked about, we're not going to talk about. We're going to talk about one kind of problem that has a bunch of different names. And like some of these names are deduplication, entity record linkage, entity resolution, co-reference, reference reconciliation. Basically, whenever the idea is, is that you have some sort of representation of uh, an entity that is, that is kind of rep that, but is represented in different ways, and you actually want to figure out that they're actually referring to the same thing. Happens all the time when whenever, particularly in administrative data, where people are having to hand enter uh, people's names and addresses, um, or 
or, or like, yeah, in, in, in that kind of thing. Yep. So to solve that particular problem, Forrest and I have worked on a Python library, which is why we're here. It's open source to do exactly that. Um, so let's get into why this is hard to do in the first place. Why is it hard to do this? Um, and this kind of goes back to what we were talking about originally. Like, there's a stark trade-off between accuracy and speed. And you want to talk about that a little bit more for us? Right. So I mean, the things that uh, so there's like two traditional ways that people solve this problem. I think maybe before Google refined the first was interns, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Like you know, and so even but even then, even they, although they're cheap, you know, they they are expensive, and they and their accuracy levels are not that high. Yep. Uh, the other thing, and they and they take and they're very slow to go through the data. Uh, the other thing that people typically do is that people write regular expressions until they get something that's good enough for this particular data set that they're working for, and that's fast once you have written it. But then the next time you have a new data set. Then you get to start again from from start from from level one, right? So you can you can write a whole bunch of things that actually will work really well for your specific data sets, and it's very really fast. But you know, it just uh, it just uh, it's just not going to work on the next one. Yep. Right. Doesn't and so th it doesn't scale in two ways. First, like interns maybe don't scale, but <laughs> there's a finite number know. of interns in the world. <laughs> but there's but even the smart ways of doing it, because if you actually think about it, how how do you find a duplicate? Well, you would need you. Naively, you would think that you would need to compare all the records that you have to all the other records. And so this is one problem with Google Refine is that it chokes at around somewhere around the, the order of 10,000 records because the number of comparisons you need to make if you do it that way goes to the square, it goes, is the square power of the number of records you have. So even a moderate small, this is not big data, right? So like, but uh, so like 100,000 records, which is certainly not big data, is gonna choke uh, even pretty smart ways of doing of doing this problem. So yeah, well, that's kind of the same thing. Yep. And this is the thing with regular expressions is that you can get something that works really well for one data set. Yep. And imagine this, this has probably happened to you guys where you're working with a data set, you write some really awesome regular expression that just like nails it, and then maybe a couple months later the data changes and your regular expression no longer works at all, or maybe like uh, the way that you imagined, and so you have to go back, and like Forrest said, you have to go back to square one, and I don't know, maybe you get really good at reg regular expressions, but you know, you still spend a lot of time doing that, as opposed to actually learning from your data. This is a sign that I took a picture of. This is, uh, this is what you have, this is a sign you have, right? This is yeah, this is from when I used to work as a mechanic. <laughs> So you can explain a little bit about right. that. Right. I mean, I think this is, you know, this is kind of, we all, we all could have to sign in any of our jobs, you know. <laughs> so, like, they're basically, uh, the classic trade-offs, the classic trade-offs, like, are that, you know, you can have it fast and good, or you can have it good and fast, or you can have it fast and cheap. We can't have all three. And that's, like, so all the different kinds of traditional solutions to the problem of deduplication, you can probably put into one of these three slots. But there, the thing is, is that like this is a like this is a this is a big problem, and it's been a big problem basically since there has been enough cheap like cheap computing power such that big businesses it's reasonable for businesses to represent their data and, and, and keep them collected in data sets. So basically, in the 60s and 70s, this is when this field, academic research into solving this problem starts, and it was a very active area basically through the two early 2000s. There's but well, there's still some very interesting work going on, but it kind of ended around 2005. You can go to the next slide. So the thing is, is that these results actually, the reason it kind of stopped in around the early 2000s is because they got really good at solving the problem. And there just wasn't that, the marginal improvement of another disserta dissertation was actually not that great. Uh, and there actually are fast, cheap, and good solutions to the problem of deduplication uh, and they're on bookshelves, and they're not, <laughs> and, they're, and, they're, and they're not downloadable. I mean, they're big companies that make a living selling this as a service, but uh, they're but they're not widely distributed. So, uh, in particular, there was this wonderful dissertation that was published in 2006 by this guy Mikhail Belinko, 
who was do who was doing his dissertation at UT Austin, and what was kind of unusual about about his work was is as is actually in some ways a kind of a synthetic piece that was this, that pulled together a bunch of different ideas that were floating around about how to how to handle this problem, and we're actually using this dissertation um, as a guide for our library. So there are three key ideas to doing this well. So we're going to talk a little bit about each one of those. Each of these first is they're going to combine information across fields. Now this is actually like a simple idea, and it's actually very surprising how often it happens, how, how, which is not frequently, right? So the thing is, is that Google Refine, for example, has these really beautiful, very smart, very powerful clustering algorithms, and they cluster only on one field at a time, right? So the thing is, is that like, if you, so the thing is, is that's great, you know? So like, knowing that two people, like two records have similar representations of a name, like that is good evidence that maybe they're the duplicates, but if they have both the name and the address, you know, that's a much stronger evidence that like maybe you're talking about the same entity. We can get into that more. Yeah. yeah. Second is, is, is that like, we're gonna, instead of hand coding, hand coding rules, we're gonna, we're gonna supply some positive, positive and negative examples of duplicate pairs, and then we're gonna learn uh, the best rules from those pairs. And then finally, we're gonna use something that's called blocking to scale up. So this thing, so we're not gonna hit a hard limit at around like 10,000 or 100,000 records. We can actually go much further and actually be able to get results in a reasonable amount of time. Well, we'll talk about it. <laughs> All right, so we broke, that, broke these three key things down into uh, their own slides. And Forrest, you're doing such a great job. I'm just gonna let you keep going. All right, so I just made that point. All right, and that point. And that point. Okay, great, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're right. Uh, yeah, so just doing that actually, like, if you, like any of these ideas by themselves like, are, worth, are worth implementing, even if you, didn't, if, you don't want, if you don't want all of them. Each of them themselves are very powerful and actually rarely used. Now the second is learn how to classify each set of data. So, so you know, there's there is so the, so in, in my opinion there is no optimal globally optimal solution to a deduplication. That for every particular data set, it's got its own peculiarities, such that uh, you're always going to be better off like trying to figure out what those are than to try to apply a generic solution. So but the thing is, but we don't want to spend too much time to doing that because that's kind of, then we're, back into the, then we're back in the world of like creating custom regular expressions for each new data set. So, and, but what we could do is we could use a small number of, of samples of, 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 we can ask, we can ask people to label like a bunch of pairs and say are they duplicates or not duplicates. And if we have that, then this is training data that we can use uh, for any kind of variety of uh, classification learning algorithms like a logistic regression or support vector machine to learn a, a best set of weights to identify duplicates. And so if you do that, then, then you, you get two things. First, you get like pretty amazing accuracy, but also like it's just much less expensive to have it takes a lot less skill to be able to identify duplicates, so you, you, you get a big savings there, and it also takes a lot less time to actually label a bunch of duplicates than, than it does to make a bunch of custom rules. So, yeah. Right, so I mean, like, in some ways you could think that this like, adaptive approach is a kind of drawback, because you're always gonna need some sort of user input. I actually don't think that, but I mean, I think that might be some philosophical differences there. All right. So we're gonna talk about blocking. All right, so the brute force way is to, is like you have, is you compare each record to every other record, and that, and that increases, uh, that increases with, the, with the square of the number of records that you have. Uh, but the key insight is, is that most records are very dissimilar from each other. They're not even close to being, they're not even, they have nothing in common. So how can we avoid making those comparisons. So blocking allows us to only compare those records that have something in common. Now what is that thing? So, well, I'll tell you in a second, but basically 
with blocking, we reduce the number of comparisons that we make by 99, like 99 percent, sometimes even more. Now, this is not there's this is not a theoretical guarantee. This is basic, but just practically, like this is what I I've seen over and over again. But there's no this is this is, there are no there are no pro there are no promise bounds, which is what is what I see on real world data. Before we move on, I think it's it's worth noting, like kind of explaining a little bit more what we mean by that. So when Forrest was describing that it takes n squared time, because we're to do it the brute force way, where we're comparing everything to everything else. If you think about it as this, and I was explaining this to Justin earlier, I liked, I liked it enough, I'm going to say it to you guys now. It's like, imagine the data that you have is this giant wad, and if you have to compare everything to everything else in that giant wad, that wad is like, imagine it's like a square, right? And it, it, you multiply it by itself, it turns into this huge square. But imagine if you took that wad and you kind of broke it into these little tiny pieces. Say you broke it into 20 pieces even. If you squared all of those, it's much less than if you square, squared the original. So that's kind of the idea of that's how it's giving you that extra efficiency by breaking it into smaller pieces and comparing less things against themselves or against others. Then that's really how you get down to that how you, how you get up to that 99% of comparisons you can just throw away. You you intelligently put them in these buckets and then. Uh, and it's a kind of, and there's a bunch of different ways which we'll go through to put them in those buckets. But once you do, that's like a huge cost saving, and that and that's how it kind of goes from n squared almost to like almost like a linear uh, time frame. So, yeah. so let's talk about some some blocking examples and what do we mean by like how do we make these buckets, right? Um, there's a, a well, there's a bunch, but we'll explain a few of them. Um, so the first one is um, the first three characters of a name of characters of a name field. So you can say uh, the example here, Jimbo Wales, Jimmy Buffett, and Jimmy Cricket. The first three characters of each one is J-A-M, and so we're going to only compare those to each other. Um, and I think you had some comments about how that's not great. <laughs> right, so I mean, so this is, so this is great. So we're not going to be comparing Jimbo Wales to, uh, to Austin Martin, right? So, which is good because that's, that name is very different. But on the other flip side of it is, is that we're also not going to be comparing uh, uh, Jimmy Buffett to James Buffett. Right, because that's just not because that's not what the rule is, right? So uh, there's a trade-off usually between um, there's a yet another trade-off between how few things you get to compare, you know, a rule that I sh and 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 leaving too much out, right? So you're not like and, and something that's so like that's something too restrictive, and so. Uh, this would be this is a real problem with kind of deciding b beforehand what like the rules that you want to use to group things together, and so we don't do that. Uh, we uh, I mean so we we have a whole bunch of different kinds of um, different kinds of different kinds of common tokens or common rules uh, of common elements that we basically are going to use to create a uh, create to create to, Create an inverted index. Um, so something like that, like it does the word Chicago appear anywhere in any of the fields, or the word tattoo? If we're talking about maybe rest businesses, see with tattoo parlors. Um, at like some, we can make up rules about like uh, like numbers plus or minus two. I mean, we have lots of ways that we could go about it, uh, and we can use all these and more. And we try to find the best set of these for each data set. So basically. We have this big group of these kind of blocking rules, and then we use a greedy algorithm to tr that, that tries to find iteratively the 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 best the, the 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 best blocking rule at each moment, which is to say the one that uh, that puts together the fewest things that are not duplicates, and but yet puts together the most things that are duplicates. Right, and uh, like there are no guarantees on that. It's a greedy algorithm, but it actually works very good in practice. So this is kind of, you know, how to get from there to there. <laughs> yeah. So uh, this isn't all just theoretical. We actually do have a, a library that we've written that does all of the things we just described, and if the presentation gods are willing. We are going to demo that for you right now. So give us a moment. We have this cool, uh, oh, whoops. I think we had a terminal window open here. Croche. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
which is great. It's a terminal in a browser window. How great is that? Pretty great. All right, so maybe explain a little bit. Um, and by the way, if you guys want to check this out and like look at the code while we're doing this, um, it's all out on GitHub uh, slash uh, uh, open hyphen city slash ddupe. Um, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll send a link out to everybody, uh, and there'll be a link at the, uh, at the end of this that we'll give it to you as well. But if you want to check it out there. Huh? Is it uh, frozen? We could refresh the page, maybe. Maybe your SSH terminal died. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, there you go. So, pardon uh, Forrest as he SSHs into his uh, machine. What's your password? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was hoping you remember it. <laughs> ah! All right, so all this stuff is, uh, as we were building this, we were basing it on a, on a set of um, uh, canonical data sets that were used for kind of academic research and which already have all the true duplicates identified. And so these results are being run over these, these training, these kind of, these, these, uh, these canonical data sets to kind of see if we can get the same level of accuracy. And we get, this is pretty typical of what we're getting right now, and I think pretty actually pretty close to I think what you can expect from. I think it's actually pretty close to the best that you could expect. Maybe you could get another few points on yeah, the precision. So okay, so what, precision and recall. Let's you have a slide that. for that. Let's just move the uh, move those over so, just so you can see those. Oh okay, yeah, yeah great. Those clipping on the screen there. So so recall is. Um, of the number of true duplicates, how many are we actually finding? So we're finding 95% of the true duplicates. Uh, the precision is of the things that were, that this algorithm is calling a duplicate, uh, how many of them are actually duplicates? And so we're basically, oftentimes we're around 90% 90, 90 of the things are, are duplicates. So this is like, this is pretty good. <laughs> I don't like, you know, if you're, uh, and I don't like, I think that we might be able to squeeze out a couple more points, but this is, this is probably, this is, this is definitely knocking interns out of the water at this point. Um, so, you know, uh, and here's the thing that's interesting, right? So this is running in 20 seconds. This data set is not big. It's around the order of like 700 records, but, uh, without blocking, um, without blocking, it's like, it, and... Uh, we, because of all the other smart stuff we did, the actual comparisons are expensive, right? And so, uh, uh, so without blocking, this thing took uh, six minutes to run. So uh, I think we actually. You have this? Yeah, sure. Can you scroll up? No, I don't think we have the technology. <laughs> <laughs> Two finger scroll, maybe? Aha! We do have the technology. Yeah, it might be worth going through this output okay, here. Yeah, sure. Okay, great. So, uh, so this is the number of duplicate pairs. So we already, this is a canonical data set that we already know about, so we already know that that's how many we want to hit. And then, our greedy algorithm is going through all of our different blocking rules, which we're calling predicates here, and it's and it's saying like we're and it's going iteratively through there, and it found two predicates that is puts together, uh, with that saying that like using this predicate rule, you will make sure that you actually make you actually do compare your true duplicate you, you compare your two true duplicates, and so we're using two predicate it finds two predicates of the first five characters on the on a name field and the first five character on an address field and then it so we're going to make 755 comparisons which reduces the number which reduces it by 99 percent uh and then we create some training data randomly and then 
we're using a logistic regression. These are the these are the optimal learned weights, and then this is the output, right? So we have the false negatives. These are the things that it wasn't able to find. And it's worth looking at those because those are actually some of those are actually pretty hard, right? You have different cities, like the Palm, the Los Angeles. You got different cities, uh, and two of the examples, and three, and four of the examples, right? Uh, you know, like West Hollywood and Hollywood are actually different places. Um, New York, Chile. West, like, those places have different addresses, you know? I mean, like, I wouldn't, like, like, this is why I think this is getting pretty close to an optimal bound, because if you're getting higher levels of accuracy, then I think you're overtraining, right? No, so that's the point, is, is that we have, we have, we, we're, in this case, we're using a set, we already know the ground truth, so we're, we're using a small subsample of, of those as training data. Overtraining is um, uh, overtraining would be like it would be overfitting. Like basically, your model is, fits your training data perfectly, but doesn't. Ge but it doesn't. But just that, like it doesn't actually generalize to uh, another data set that's very similar. So that could happen. Like I don't know. What's a good example of that? That's a good one. Yeah, that's a good way of thinking about it. But. Uh, um, I don't know. I think you, if you've ever read an academic paper, then you've seen overfitting. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it just basically that you, that you, uh, that it fits your training data very well, but it doesn't generalize to, to other, to, to data that it should, that it should. Yeah. So I think that's at first the I demo. We have a few more slides left to go through here. If we can, uh, thanks for being our, uh, our surrogate. Uh, laptop user. Now, can I start the presentation from the slide we were on? No, oh, it's this one. It's this one. Uh, it's uh, here. I'll find it. It's probably uh, down here. Apologies. Uh, yeah, right. Okay, I think we're almost uh, we're almost there. Whoops. Here's the demo. And can we uh, start from this slide? I hope it starts from the right slide. It does not. <laughs> <laughs> they never do, right? Hold on a second. Can you hold this? Yeah. Hold on. Talk about something else that's really interesting. All right. So, all right. So, well, I can say, like, why we, so why we, the reason why we wrote this quite done was, like, twofold. First of all, because, because, <laughs> because uh, because Python is the language that I know best, uh, and also because it's the language that the kind of that certainly not open government folks, but uh, but uh, news journalists, data journalists have kind of settled on. That is like most of the tools that have wide adoption. I mean, the small number of journalists who are actually trying to use big data are all written in Python, and that's definitely a target audience for us. And. Yeah, we watch them run. Yeah. Right, so the, here's the thing is, is that, um, you know, so in practice, again, there are no guarantees on this. In practice, the number of comparisons that you get with blocking does seem to increase kind of linearly with the size of the data set. But there are like, but like, you can always create a perverse data set where that would not be true. Okay. Is this not work, Bill? Oh, no, there it is. Okay. It works for you. Make out with it. All right. Uh, so, so this is, so we showed you the demo, right? And it works. And yay. So what's the next step, right? Um, I'd say the next immediate step is right now we have a working uh, with training data, which is a canonical data set. We need to come up with a simple way for you to for a human to say, okay, I'm going to use it for a human to say yes or no to a set of duplicates that are put in front of them. Oh, can I switch mics? Is this better? I don't know. Oh. Right, we'll just is this the one you're using? Maybe my voice isn't booming. It. There you go. Oh, it's like. Okay, great. So, uh, so that's that's a step that we're working on immediately. Um, then we want to package it in a nice standalone Python library. We actually kind of already have that. Uh, 
um, if you go to the GitHub, uh, our GitHub page, which I think we had on a previous slide, uh, github.com slash open hyphen city slash dedupe. Um, you can actually download it and run it yourself. You don't have to install any dependencies or anything like that. We thought originally we were going to have to have SciPy, NumPy in there, but actually we're doing it all without it. Um, and we wrote some of those algorithms by hand. And also, um, uh, yeah, I think we took somebody's linear regression. Yeah, we're going to rewrite that. Yeah, we're going to write that. Yeah. Uh, but it's included. So, uh, so yeah. this is actually something that we could use your help with. This is that uh, we have not actually written. We don't. We need some guidance on writing a Pythonic library. So, uh, uh, yeah, I think there's a big difference between having something that runs and having something that is like uh, and that works well for people as a library. Right. And uh, that's that's something that if you anyone has done that uh, and would like to talk to us afterwards, we would be very appreciative about very appreciative of having those conversations. Um, there we go. Uh, this also goes with creating libraries, coming up with some vignettes. I think that's part of the library, creating the library. Um, we plan on applying to the Maggie Challenge for data, since this seems kind of like right up that alley there. Um, if you're familiar with the Maggie Challenge, challenge they are giving away money to people who make apps uh, for different things. First round was community. I don't think they've announced the winners yet, have they? No. They will soon, I think. That one was community round, I believe. This one is for data. So creating tools uh, for journalists. Uh, is it for journalists specifically, or is it in general? Eh, data project. Right. So this is that's what this is. Um, and we expect to have a beta to release that works for the likes of everyone in this room by the end of the summer. So I think we kind of touched on what we can do to help with that previous slide with uh, getting some input on creating a library. But we have a Google group that we started using uh, to kind of assemble the group of people uh, that we were going to work on this with. Um, so we haven't really used it much, but I think repurposing it for people to be beta testers for this library once we have a working version would be great. Uh, and also if people want to like email the group and if we can get maybe get a community around this. Uh, that would be amazing because that's kind of that's why we're doing this. Um, we did it in Python first, and I'm sorry that you know, I'm saying this is a shy pie. Chippy. Uh, maybe, you know, but uh, I think that, you know, you know obviously Python is not the only way to jump in. Uh, I'm sure there's tons of people who love it. Ruby, C Sharp, uh, JavaScript, or <laughs> maybe not JavaScript. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there's a lot of uh, existing code bases out there that already are in this realm, right? CSV kit, Panda, um, your import scripts that you've already painstakingly created. Um, we mentioned Google Refine, but again, I can't say enough good things about Refine. It's just a really great tool, um, although there are some downsides that Forrest mentioned. Um, but like the super child of both of these together would be uh, a really great thing. It's got a great user interface. Somehow we could write a plugin, which I think it does support plugins. Um, that would be an amazing tool. It would put it in a lot of people's hands that may, maybe aren't necessarily programmers, right? At this point, the audience, like the immediate audience, is you guys, right? People who know how to program in Python. Um, but I mean, this is a problem everybody has, right? Uh, and not everybody can hire a developer, and sometimes you're just curious. You don't know enough to go out on some adventure with regular expressions of them. So having having this tool brought down to a bar that's easy for people to pick up is, is a, would be a huge win. Uh, and then I think this kind of goes with Google Refine. If we don't Google, if we can't do Google Refine, we maybe just make something that looks and works like Google Refine, right? A nice graphical user interface that you can pass in data and get out <coughs> nice, a nice clean code and not have to worry about the family stuff. You want to say, this is your quote. Uh, yeah. I mean, basically, we just want to flip the ratio. I mean, it's, it's, if we want to spend uh, more time doing, un trying to understand and learn from the data, as opposed to getting it into the shape that, like, you know, the shape, that, uh, in, instead of trying to clean it up, so th that we can do that. So we'll leave it to questions. Um, yeah, I don't know if you want to run around with a. Uh, this is 
just not get my exercise, folks. From all that beer I have to burn off. Oh. Um, I'm just wondering uh, what some of the inputs and outputs of uh, the function is, like how you currently put data into it and in what form you get data back. Yeah, so we're, uh, we're, just, we're definitely still thinking through the API a little bit, and uh, I think we're trying to get some we're trying to get some help in thinking about exactly how to do that. Right now, uh, we, you pass in two objects. Uh, the first object is uh, your data. It's in, in the form of an array. I mean, a, a, actually, I guess it could be an array. A list of uh, a list of dictionaries where one of the keys is a unique identifier. Um, and then you have another object, which is also, in this case, a dictionary that describes the data model. This, you know, so it tells you what all those different, uh, all the different parts of your data are, what kind of, what kind of value it is, what is it a string, is it a, is it a phone number, for example, and then it has some other stuff as well. So that's the input, uh, and then, like, at the largest level, and then the output on the largest level is either one of two things. Either it's just a, a, a list, that, that a list of tuples, where each tuple is, shows, uh, is a, uh, is, a, is, a, is a pair showing the unique, unique identifiers that are, uh, that are duplicates. Or uh, we, I think we're also going to do some clustering for you. So it says like, so they'll it could be tuples of arbitrary length. They're saying all these things are likely to be referring to the same entity. Hi, uh, what uh, learning scheme are you using? Is it just lo uh, logistic regression right now, or are you doing any neural networks, or? Uh... No, I, you know, I think that, uh, I'm just not convinced that you're gonna do better with um, regularized logistic regression. Okay. Yeah. And I also got an ETL for Python, so I'll talk to you. Great. There's a question. You mentioned the algorithm, so what kind of algorithm you use? I'm sorry, what's that? Uh, algorithm, algorithm. Uh, oh, okay, great. Uh, so, um, right, so one of the one of the secret sauces that we didn't talk about is is that we're, is, is that we're using um, uh, a string, uh, a, a, a string distance called an affine gap distance, which is very, very good for uh, for actual real administrative data, that is not is not that common. It's basically an extension of the Levenstein distance, which some of you may have seen, but which you pay um, in practice. You end up paying a lot less for abbreviations or bit or like whole large insertions of text. So if you like, it's like really good if you're if someone has like a nickname in the middle of their name. But they have the same, but they have the same first name and last name. But they have this big block of text in the middle. That you pay less for that, and it actually works extreme. It's really a much, much better um, string distance for real, for much, for a lot of real world data. Uh, and then there is, you know, there's a just a, forget the name of the. Oh, so then the 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 uh, the blocking algorithm is the red blue cover is a red blue cover algorithm. Uh, greedy algorithm for solving that problem, and you know everything else is kind of those are the kind of two of the more fancy ones. We document <laughs> we'll document those in the uh, in the README, um, and also I'd like to say that the affine gap uh, that we implemented is um, we actually wrote that one from the textbook, and it's out there in the library. Uh, it's it's its own standalone file, affine gap.py. So if you guys want to play around with just using that uh, piece of it. Uh, and testing it out with your own stuff, it's out there. So you feel free to grab that. Grab that. Wait, 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 wait. So the translations in one way or another are irrelevant basically for the matching. Is that correct? So like affine transformations are equivalent moved one way or another, right? So X. Oh. Yeah, so, uh, so, yeah, uh, so, uh, so to, to, to make sure I understand it, you're to, saying to like the question does, the uh, logarithms are by, symmetric or not? By asymmetric. Well, no, not 
Right, exactly. So that's the thing is, is, is that you pay more so that, so, right, so, so basically an, what the thing with the affine gap distance and how it's different from a Levenstein at a distance is that you pay a certain amount for starting to insert a set of characters and that is a constant and then you pay another smaller amount typically for each additional uh, for each additional uh, length of each additional character you insert or delete, so it's a so it's a constant plus uh, a plus some you know some variable amount. Okay, last question in the back here. Quick. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hey, so uh, the predicates in your example. Right. Uh, where do they come from? Are they from the library? Does a user provide them? And if they're from the library, are they generalizable to any data set or is it specific to the data set in your example? So they're super simple, right? So uh, the, we, like, there's a file called predicates that, by, that's in the library, um, but they're super simple. Like, you know, the first five characters of predicate, all that is is you just grab the first five elements of a string, right? So like that's that's actually like a two line function, and one of the lines is def <laughs> to declare the function, um, and so yeah I mean so we implemented a set of predicates that were described like that were identified by Belenko, but um, they're but it's up to you I mean they're actually they're that they're quite easy to write and if you think that there's something else that will work well on a different data set then you should definitely. Uh, try it out, and if it does, then you should let us know and we'll include it. All right, thank you very much, guys. Thank you. That was awesome. So we have, uh, we're going to take